Welcome to From His Heart, where today, Pastor Jeff Shreve will help you overcome one of the most debilitating problems you may face. Travel with him into the daunting land of the giants to find victory over the giant of worry. If you have your Bible, please turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we want to talk today about our final giant in the series, Land of the Giants, and that is the giant of worry. I was reading a story about a college student. His name was Daniel. He was 19 years old. He was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He felt called into the ministry, and he was working in school to try and catapult him into a ministry position down the road. And while in college, you know, college is designed to be a time of learning. It's also a time to, to have fun because there's lots of freedom and there's things to do and lots of stuff uh, on campus good, clean fun, but he wasn't having any fun at all. Daniel couldn't even really enjoy a meal because his stomach was tied up in knots and he couldn't keep anything down. He went to the doctor, had a bunch of tests run, and the doctor came back to him with the diagnosis and he said, "Uh, son, he said, you have the beginnings of a very serious stomach ulcer. And Daniel said, well, doctor, how can that be? And the doctor looked at his chart and wasn't anything out of the ordinary with his medical background or anything like that. And then the doctor looked at him and said, you know, sometimes people get ulcers because of chronic worry. He said, Daniel, are you a worrier? And Daniel hung his head in shame because he worried about everything. He worried about tests, he worried about papers, he worried about uh, his social life, he worried about his future. He was a worrier, and that worry was stealing his joy and stealing his peace and stealing his health. Can you relate to the issue of worry? Can you relate to the giant that faces off against us, the giant of worry? So many of us can, and we worry about lots of things. We worry about family. We worry about finances. We worry about our physical health. We worry about the future. Worry, the English word worry, is an interesting word. It comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word. That word is wirgen, W-Y-R-G-A-N. And that word means to strangle. And it's used to describe a dog with a shoe. Have you ever seen a dog with an old shoe or a slipper? They get that shoe in their, in their teeth and they take it back and forth and they try and just rip it apart that way. They just go back and forth with that shoe or that slipper. That's a picture of worry. One preacher described it this way. It's a thin stream of fear that courses through your mind and steals away your peace. Dr. Wayne McDill, who is my preaching professor at Southeastern Seminary, a dear friend to this day, I took several classes from him. One of the classes I took from him was, had to do with emotions. He had written a book called The Message in Your Emotions, and one of the things that he said in this book had to do with worry, and I love the definition that he gives. He said, Anxiety, worry, here's the definition. The tension and distress experienced over the anticipated loss, whether real or imagined, of some valued possession. That is worry to a T. The tension and distress 
experienced over the anticipated loss, whether real or imagined, of some valued possession. Now, God doesn't want us to worry. We know that for certain because in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to this issue. He talks about the giant of worry that uh, all human beings face, and he tells us three times directly in Matthew chapter 6, do not be anxious for your life. Do not worry. Over and over and over, don't worry. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life. Do not be worried about your life. As to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on, is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. He was speaking to people gathered on the hillside there at the Sea of Galilee, just regular folks, people that were farmers, many of them, people that were just hand-to-mouth, paycheck-to-paycheck, so to speak. And these were people who were worried about the basic necessities of life, what we shall eat and what we shall drink and with what shall we clothe ourselves. He spoke to them directly about the issue of worry. And I want you to see as we talk about winning the battle with this giant, a threefold action plan from this passage that we just read. And if you put this plan into action in your life, this three-step, threefold action plan, you can have victory over the issue of worry and over the giant of worry. So let's look at these three steps. The first step, how do you have victory? You trust God to take care of you. Trust God to take care of you. Jesus told them, look at the birds, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow. They don't, they don't dig up and, and plant things. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Birds don't have a pantry. They don't have a fridge. They don't have a storage unit outside in the garage. They just trust God to provide for them. And as they go seek food, the Lord provides them food. And the Lord says, hey, do you see the birds? It's the lesser to the greater argument. Do you see the birds? If I provide for the birds, don't you think I'd provide for you? As he says down in verse 32, O oh, men of little faith. Well, God does provide for us, and so we can trust him to take care of us. So here's what I want you to see about worry, because we tend to do worry so well. We, it just comes naturally to us. Uh, it, it's not something you have to teach people to do. They just naturally do it, worried about tomorrow. So notice with me three truths about worry. Trust God, don't worry. Worry... Best thing that we can say about worry is worry is useless. Worry is useless. Jesus said in verse 27, and which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit to his lifespan? I mean, what does worry do? 
Worry doesn't do anything. Worry never dried a tear. Worry never solved a problem. Worry never does anything constructive. Hey, you can't worry your way to a longer life because worry is useless. But not only is it useless, worry is harmful. Worry will do to your body what sand does to machinery. Worry will gum up the works. Just like Daniel and his experience with stomach, the stomach ulcer, where was he getting that? He was getting that from worry. If you look up on the internet, WebMD, you know, for those of you who can't afford to go see the doctor, go see WebMD. I mean, you can get a lot of information from WebMD. All my doctor friends in our congregation hate WebMD because people come to see the doctor and they've already got things figured out because they went to the internet. And uh, it doesn't really work like that. But on WebMD, if you look up the effects, medical effects on your human body with worry, you'll find out that worry can cause a host of problems. Worry can cause ulcers, it can cause colitis, it can cause high blood pressure, it can cause eczema, it can cause insomnia, it can cause respiratory problems. All sorts of harmful things because of this thing called worry. So worry is useless, worry is harmful, and watch this, third truth about worry. Worry is sinful. It's a sin to worry. I wrote that in the book, Runaway Emotions, and some blogger or somebody that was reading my book and, and uh, you know, giving her opinion on the book, she went off on me because she did not like the fact that I said worry is sinful. I felt like writing her back and say, hey, I didn't preach uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did. You get, you take it up with him. He says three times in Matthew chapter 6 that don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Worry is sinful. Worry breaks the command of God to not worry. See, worry is the opposite of faith. And Romans 14 verse 23 says, and whatever is not from faith is sin. George Mueller, that great man of faith, said this, worry starts where faith ends. Worry and faith don't coexist because if you're worried, you're not trusting God. And if you're trusting God, you're not worried. And really, when you think about it, worry is practical atheism. Now, real atheism, spiritual atheism is saying, I don't believe there is a God. Worry is practical atheism. Atheism. It's not saying there is no God. It's living as if there is no God. And for a Christian to live as if there is no God, that's a serious, serious issue. Let me tell you what worry says to God. Worry says to God, God, I, you must have forgotten what's going on in my life. God, are you not aware what I'm facing here? God, do you not know what's coming up? Lord, have you lost me on the GPS? God, are you not really aware? Or, or maybe it says to God, uh, Lord, I see that you're aware, but I guess you don't care. I guess you don't care about me. You don't care what I'm going through. You don't care what I'm facing. Because if you cared about me, then you would change my circumstances. Or maybe it says this, God, I think you're aware, and God, I think you care, but... God, you must not be able in this situation. Why am I worried? It's because God is not able to do. God is not, or God is able to do, he's not willing to do. And so we get stuck in the horns of a dilemma. Does God care and not want to help me? Or does uh, God not care and, and uh, can't help me? Uh, does God not have the power? Does he have the heart but not the power? All those things. Those are damaging things in our relationship with the Lord. Because the Lord is the God of all flesh, Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? The things we worry about? God says, you know, I can take care of that. And you're living like I don't exist. And you're living like I can't do in your life. Look at Matthew 31 again. He says, do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles 
eagerly seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So don't be a man of little faith. Trust me and believe me, and don't live like the Gentiles who don't know me. Live like someone who knows that I'm a God who's aware, I'm a God who cares, I'm a God who is able. Some months ago, Mark Proctor, our pastor of spiritual development, gave me a CD series from Charles Stanley. And it was Charles talking to some pastors, and he was talking about the prayer life of a pastor. And there were four CDs, and uh, I don't know exactly where he was when he delivered this, but he was in a conference with these guys. And on the fourth day, the fourth CD, he talked about his own life. And if you know anything about Dr. Charles Stanley, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, and the, uh, the speaker for uh, In Touch Ministries, the, the founder of In Touch Ministries, um, he went through some really hard times when he went to First Baptist Atlanta. He, w- he went there in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, as the associate pastor. The pastor had been there about 15, 16 years, and then after a year of Charles coming on board, the pastor left. And there were lots of people who liked Charles and wanted to make Charles the pastor, but there was one guy on the decision team that didn't want Charles. Charles wasn't a big enough name, and they wanted to have a big name. We're First Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. We want to have a big name. So he didn't like Charles. So he wanted Charles to, they they wanted him to leave so they could clear the decks for a new guy to come on board. Well, Charles wouldn't leave because Charles Charles said, well, God called me here, and and God's not telling me to leave, and so until God tells me to leave, I'm going to be here. And they put such pressure on Charles Stanley to leave, and he wouldn't leave. He said, I can't leave. God's not released me from here. Now, you can fire me. Uh, That's out of my control. But if you fire me, then that's on you. But I'm not resigning. And he said the pressure was so great, and it was building. And he had about 300 people in the church that didn't want him there. That's a lot. I don't care how big your church is. 300 people is a lot. And so he said when he was in the thick of it, Uh, Man, there was just pressure, 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 and and it would have been very easy to let the thin stream of fear just course through your mind and steal away your peace. And he just uh, pressed into the Lord, and he prayed, and he got on his face, and he called upon the Lord, and uh, everything was moving to a head on a Wednesday night business meeting where they were going to vote to get him out, to bar him from the pulpit. The the only problem was with these people that didn't like him, didn't want him there. Every time Charles preached, God blessed, and people came, and the church was growing and growing and growing, and they were just, oh, I hate this guy, and I hate that God is blessing him. So Charles said it was building up to a head, and about a month before everything came to a head, an older lady in the church invited him to come to the house to have lunch with her. She had been a nurse for 50 years. She was retired. And so he came to her house, and he had lunch with her, and she was there just to encourage him. And then after the meal, she said, I want to show you something. And so she took him into a room, and she showed him a painting of David, uh, of uh, Daniel in the lion's den. I think we have a picture of this. And she showed him this kind of a painting. I don't know if this is the exact one, but this is a famous one. And she said to Charles, she said, Charles, what do you see? And he looked at that, and he said, well, I see Daniel, and I see him in the lion's den, and I see all the lions around him. And and in the fuller picture, there were some bones uh, on the the base of the picture. And he said, you know, um, that's, that's what I see. And she said, look more closely at Daniel. And so he looked at Daniel, and she put her arm around him, and she said to this, Charles, Do you see his eyes? He's not looking at the lions. He's looking up to God. And Charles said, that was the greatest sermon I'd ever heard in my life. He said, it was as if the Lord Jesus just came and put his arm around me and said, Charles, you just keep looking to me. You just keep trusting me. Don't look at the lions who are trying to devour you and steal from you and destroy you. You look 
to me. Hey, how do you win in the battle with worry? The first step, you trust God to take care of you. If he takes care of birds, he will take care of you. If he takes care of the fields and make the, makes the fields more beautiful than Solomon could ever adorn himself, and he does that just for a day because they come up, the flowers come up, and they're thrown into the furnace, will he not do much more for you, O oh, men of little faith? Step number one, trust God to take care of you. Step number two, give God ownership of all you possess. Now look at the definition of worry again. It's the tension and distress experienced over the anticipated loss, whether real or imagined, of some valued possession. Worry has to do with possessions. Worry has to do with your possessions. It has to do with your things. It has to do with your family. It has to do with your car, with your marriage, with your job, with your 401k, with your future. It's a personal possession. We don't worry about other people's stuff. We worry about our stuff. We don't worry about other people's kids. We worry about our kids and our grandkids. It's a personal thing, and it has to do with possession. Now, this is what you need to remember. God owns everything. You don't own anything. God, own it, God, God owns everything. And in this passage, we read, and it's obvious from the passage, that God is over the birds, and he's over the fields, and he's over the flowers. He's over it all. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Everything belongs to God. Nothing belongs to you. And the reason you are worried and the reason I get worried is because I take ownership of that which doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. Now, you might have remembered, I told you, when I worked in the business world, first outside sales job I had, I worked for waste management. Waste management was a big company, and uh, I worked in the commercial division, and I sold trash dumpsters, and that's a pretty unglamorous job, selling trash service. You know, it doesn't get much unglamorous than that, except it did when I was working there because we added a product line, portable toilets. And so, I mean, that's usually really sunk down to the, the lowest of the low. I sell trash and portable toilets. But they gave me at waste management, a company car. I'd never had a company car before. I was two years out of college, and uh, I had worked in the oil patch for a couple of years selling pipe couplings, and then I got this job. It was right before Debbie and I got married, and so I had this sales job, and I had a company car. Company cars are great. Any of you who've had a company car or you have a company car or a company truck, it's a great perk. Why? Because you don't own it. You just get to drive it. And you get with the company car, you get a company car charge card. So anything you need for the car, just put it on the card. So I would go, you know, we had a deal with Firestone. Uh, when I graduated from waste management, went to Nalco Chemical Company, I had a company car too, and Nalco had a deal with Firestone. And so anytime you need something, you go to a Firestone station and they can change your oil, they can do some minor repair work, and they can mess with your tires. So I'd go in there and get the oil change, and they'd say, you know, your tires kind of look a little bald. I said, they do? I said, yeah. I said, well, let's get new tires. I mean, it's a company car. We need to make sure the company car looks good. They'd say, well, you know, we, we pulled out your air filter. It's a little, a little dusty. A little dark, they, you know how they show it to you? They got the guy in the back pouring the dirt in there, and then they show it to you. <laughs> Say, here, and, and I'd be like, man, we need to change that. So come, I said, what do you think? Well, I think you need to change it. I was like, all right, put it on the card. You know, it wasn't my car, it's the company car. And what does the company want? The company wants a good car out there on the road representing uh, their business. And so my attitude toward the company car was totally different than my attitude toward our minivan. Because our minivan is like, I'm paying for this. We go to Firestone, they say, your, your air filter's a little dirty. That's nah, good enough. I just put it back on, blow on it or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's good. Well, your tires are a little bald. I can get another 10,000 out of that. You know, it's just totally different when you're paying for it and it's on your dime versus the company dime. 
Now, here's the thing, guys and gals. Newsflash. Everything in your life is a company car. Everything. Your kids, a company car. Your house, a company car. Your job, a company car. Your health, a company car. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the company, and the company is God. So don't assume ownership of that which belongs to him. If you do, you'll be worried and bothered about so many things. And the Lord will say to you, listen, I own that. You don't own that. That's a company car, so just trust me with it. And enjoy what I've given you to use. See, God owns everything, and God allows you and me to manage his possessions. When the company gave me a company car, with that company car came the onus of taking care of it. Now, I didn't pay for anything associated with it, but I had to take care of the car. I had to make sure the car, that I changed the oil on time, that I made sure that uh, things were running right, and that if it started to have mechanical problems, I took it in early. And so it was on me to manage the possessions of the company and manage the car of the company, but it wasn't my car. It was their car. And when I left the company, they took the car back because it didn't belong to me. It belonged to them. Now, the Lord says this in Matthew chapter 25 when he tells the parable of the stewards who were supposed to take care of his stuff. He said this, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slave and entrusted his possessions to them. He, he didn't give them his possessions and says, now those are yours. No. He said, these are my possessions. I'm entrusting these to you. And as it says in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 19, do business with this until I come. And in the passage in Matthew chapter 25, when the king came back, you know, he gave each one of them a talent. Five talents for one guy, two talents for another guy, one talent for the third guy. Well, he came back and he settled accounts. What did you do with what I gave you? I want to have my return on my investment. I allowed you to manage this. Show me what you did with it. Well, they didn't get to keep any of it. It all belonged to the king. All they did was manage it. And see, you and I are managers of God's stuff. And remember this about worry. See, worry is always future. It's the anticipated loss of some possession of value, and it's future. Nobody's worried about what happened last year. No, we're worried about what is coming up because worry is, is anticipated in the future. And so what do we do when we worry about things? We're going to lose something. So we just want to hold on to it. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. I'm going to lose my loved one. And so we try and hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to worry, worry, worry. Worry is wasteful. Worry is harmful. Worry doesn't solve a problem. Worry is useless. But we do that. We worry because we're trying to hold on to it so we don't lose this valued possession. When I was 20 years old, I was in my apartment in Austin studying for a final exam at the University of Texas. I was at the table, kitchen table studying. I was getting tired, and I needed to reinvigorate myself to be able to study, so I scratched my head real hard to get the brain cells going again. And when I scratched my head real hard, about 12 hairs came out. I thought, what in the world? It's got to be a fluke. So I did it again. Ten, twelve more came out. I quit scratching. <laughs> I said, could it be? It can't be. This can't be right. I think I'm losing my hair. Man, when I was younger, I had hair. I had lots of hair. I looked a little bit like Fabio. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, wow is right. It's, it <laughs> looks good, doesn't it? And uh, so that's, that was a young Jeff Shree. That was just a couple of years ago. And uh, <laughs> so that's, I had hair like that. And now it was starting to give up. It was starting to let loose. And, uh, you know, it's like the old expression of men. 
turn gray, but don't turn loose, you know, and mine was turning loose, and so, uh, you know, as it, as it just kept getting worse and worse, I was glad I had hair in my wedding pictures, you know, at 23, but uh, it, it just kept falling out, and, and you know, for those of you who are losing your hair, uh, you really agonize over that, and you spend time in the mirror, and you really are looking, and you're starting to comb it, and your part starts to change, you know, and you're trying to cover up some things, and then you look in the back, and you're like, good night, where's this going to stop, and when's it going to end, and, and you'd hold on, and I'd see people, friends, that I hadn't seen in a while, and they'd just stare at the top of my head. <laughs> One of my roommates from college, I saw him. Uh, some years after I got out of college. He's staring up here. It's like, down here, down here, you know. <laughs> but he's staring at my hairline because it was just going away. And, uh, man, it, it's traumatic to lose your hair until I got to the place where, you know, I just had about four or five brave soldiers there, you know. And uh, I was like, guys, we lost the battle. And I just shaved it all off. And let me tell you something, it's one of the most freeing things to shave your head. Because as a guy losing his hair, once you just say, I give up, and you shave it all off, and you lose it all, then you don't worry anymore about losing it. Why? Because it's gone. <laughs> There's nothing there anymore. I never think about my hair anymore. As I told one group years ago, I always look the same. You come to my house at 2 o'clock in the morning, this is what you see. <laughs> Debbie, sometimes when we first got married, she'd wake up in the morning and she looked like Belle Darcone head. I mean, it's just, <laughs> she's got a lot of hair and just go everywhere, you know. I didn't have that. It's like, what you see is what you get, you know. Uh, what's the point the point is this, you want to win in the battle of worry? You want to beat the giant of worry? Quit holding on to things that don't belong to you anyway. Give them over to God. Say, God, that belongs to you. And when you lose it to God, there is peace that comes. Because you're not worried about that stuff anymore. John Wesley, the father of the Methodist church was told one day, Mr. Wesley, your house just burned down. And he said, that can't be right. I don't have a house. He said, the one I live in belongs to God. Now, if his house burned down, that's just one less thing I have to manage. That's the attitude that you need to have. It all belongs to God, so I give it to God. Hey, what's the first step in winning the war? Trust God to take care of you. What's the second step? Give God ownership of all you possess. And the third step, seek God first in your life. Verse 33 says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek him first. So start your day with God. You want to have victory over the giant of worry? Start your day with God. Seek him first. I was reading something by Kathy Lee Gifford. She wrote a new book, The Rock, the, Rab the, the, Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi. And in the introduction, she talks about how the Lord's been working in her life. And one of the things that she said was, uh, in her quiet time, the Lord said to me, said to her, Kathy, you need to seek first my kingdom. She said, that's right, Lord, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He said, no, you need to seek me first. And she said, well, I'm endeavoring to do that, Lord. He said, no, you need to seek me first. And she said, do you mean first thing in the morning? He said, yes. And she said, well, Lord, I work on Good Morning America, and the car comes for me at 6 a.m. to take me an hour's drive to the studio. And she said, if I seek you first, I'm going to have to get up really early. And God says, seek me first. And Kathy Lee said she started getting up before 4 a.m., to spend time with God in prayer and time with God in his word. And she said, those times changed my life. And they gave me such a, a desire for God and such an appreciation for his word. And they just filled my heart with joy. 
when she sought God first. I love this poem by Ralph Spaulding Cushman. It says this, I met God in the morning when my day was at its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long the presence lingered. All day long he stayed with me. And we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to us a peace and rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mind when I too had loosed the moorings with the presence left behind. So I think I know the secret. Learn from many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him through the day. Seek God first. Start your day with God. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall clothe yourself with, all your needs, all these things that you need will be added to you. He will take care of that if you put him first. And then take life one day at a time. Verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't think about tomorrow, because worry is always in the future. You're always thinking in the future, and it's take one day at a time. Don't think about tomorrow. Now, you can plan for tomorrow, but don't worry about tomorrow. Big difference between planning for tomorrow and worrying about tomorrow. Live in today because each day has enough trouble of its own. And listen, God is a daily provider. Give us this day our daily bread. God's a daily provider. And the daily bread that he gave, the pictures in the Old Testament, when he rained manna down from heaven, and when did the manna come? Every day. In the morning, it came, and they would gather it up. And if they waited, it wasn't there. The sun would burn it off, and it was gone. Now, on Friday, God would give a double dose because they weren't supposed to gather on Saturday. But every other day, it's you gather it in the morning. And don't store it. And some of them tried to store it, and it grew foul and bred worms because the Lord says, you're not storing it up. It's your sustenance your daily bread, you eat it today, I give you more daily bread tomorrow. So what does that say to us? God provides his grace for today's needs. He doesn't provide his grace today for tomorrow's needs. And so if I worry about tomorrow, the Lord says, I don't have any grace for you tomorrow. I just have grace for you for today. And so live in today, live in the moment And don't worry about tomorrow. Corey ten Boom said this, Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So don't be anxious. Don't be worried about tomorrow. And then lastly, let Jesus be your one and only master. You know, the backdrop of all the verses that we read from Matthew 6, 25 to the end, verse 34, the backdrop is verse 24, where it says this, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and riches, God and mammon, God and wealth. You can't do that. You can't serve God and anything else, because God is to be God alone in your life. And so choose to let Jesus be your one and only master. You know, the Bible says of him that he's the prince of peace. And when the prince of peace is enthroned in your heart, there's peace. Mary and Martha had Jesus over for dinner in Luke chapter 10. And uh, Mary and Martha are in the kitchen making meatloaf for the master. They are all excited because Jesus had come over for dinner. And then all of a sudden, as Martha's preparing, Mary slips out. She goes in where the, the men are, and she sits at Jesus' feet, and she's listening to his word. And Martha's in the kitchen all alone, and she gets upset because Mary's not there to help her. And so she goes out to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, do you not see what's happening? 
My sister has left me all alone to do the cooking and to do the work. You tell her to help me. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha. When you get your name said twice, it's typically a bad deal, right? Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. The good part is to put yourself at Jesus' feet and listen to his words. When the Lord is there in the house, who cares about dinner? Who cares about meatloaf for the master? It's all about the master. And you put him first and enthrone him as your king. Listen, you can tell very easily if you're trusting Jesus, if you have him enthroned as king, or if you have gotten off course. Is there peace in your heart right now? There can be. There can be. My friend, thanks for watching today. We always like to close out the broadcast by asking you this simple question. Do you know for certain that you have a personal relationship with Jesus? If not, now is the time to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, I'm lost, I can't save myself, but I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead, that you are God in the flesh, and I surrender my life to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can be of help to you. Hey, you are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real